Thanks, everybody, for being here this morning. How are you all this morning? It's a little small group this morning, so y'all get me all to yourselves, right? Now, we got the team. I want to introduce the team. You know Jada, our chief of communications. You got uh, Charles White and Ronald who work in our communications department. Dr. Simpson's our deputy superintendent, um, one of three. Um, we got Dr. Wilson is our chief of HR. And then, of course, we've got Peter Poole. He's a new guy on, on the block. Uh, he's re now responsible for our television, managing our television station. So over the course of the year, you'll see more programming on our television station. So we're excited about that. But thank you all for being here. You know, there are sometimes we have a large crowd. There are sometimes we have a, low, you know, a little crowd. And I, I do visit the various minister or, uh, associations, like I have one coming up on Wednesday, on Monday. Monday evening, so I guess if they see me there, they don't need to see me here, right? So this is for everybody who may not be connected to those other organizations who they know that I'll be coming, but it's open to, you know, I want all faith-based leaders to feel free to come to this space um, and give us, a, it gives us a chance to share what we're doing to hear from you all, dialogue toward always improving our school system. I really just want, we really want to just see the school system continuously improve. And we recognize that while I have a, a perspective as a superintendent, staff has a perspective as a staff, you have a different perspective because you are, you are dealing with families in a different capacity than we are. You're dealing with those who come to your church, you're in the community. And so you, you, you get, a, uh, uh, I like to say, you get multiple perspectives about what's going on. And so I like to, for you all to come and share your perspectives with us so we can, the word we like to use is triangulate the data to see if what we're seeing is what you're seeing and what we're hearing is what you're hearing. And if there's something that we need to, an inconsistency, we need to figure out what we need to address to keep the district moving in the right direction and to make sure that we're working on the right work. So what I like to do very quickly is just share what you have. And um, you first have our legislative priorities as approved by the Board of Education. And so this is for your FYI and what we encourage you to do is just familiarize yourselves with the priorities and if there are any efforts uh, that you can participate in relative to the legislative legislative session feel free to connect with the state uh, representatives or the state senators that represent our area and we sent that out to everyone but these are the areas that we will be working in, in case there's legislation that impacts Clayton County we always make sure that we're right there to inform the process the next thing you have is a document that basically, uh, two documents, I'll start with this one. This is like what we call our little profile sheet. It gives you a little information about the district, our vision, mission statement, all the schools, uh, some numbers that may be helpful for you to know, um, select programs that are available, and some facts about the school system on the back side, grad information, et cetera. And so we just update this from time to time with information that we think would be helpful to you uh, to stay informed in the event that you have to share and respond to your constituents. The other document that you have is this document that we prepared just for this year because it outlines by division or department the things that we have been working on and accomplishing over the last two years. Sometimes as we start a new year, we forget what we've done in the previous years. And so we thought it would be helpful for all of us to start this year, but keep reminding ourselves of what we've accomplished. So as we continue to do more work, we don't forget what we have done and where we have come from. And so feel free to take time to look over this document. Again, I won't read it to you, but it's organized by uh, division department area. And then on the back of it, it has the nine building blocks for high performing school systems that serve as our framework as we move our district forward. And then areas that we're targeting for improvement um, relative to academic areas. And then of course, culture and climate, things that we're always working on, specifically some uh, areas that we thought that um, we needed to make more improvement in. And so that's on here as well. But what I'd like to do is, if you will, on the first section, where it talks about school leadership, curriculum, instruction, and assessment, I just want you to look at that chart. Because this chart gives you an idea of, uh, about the, the challenge and the work that we've got to do here in Clayton County. So if you will, I want you to see the percents of students who are proficient or distinguished. That's basically the kids who are passing the test, if you will, for each subject area. For this past spring, it's the last bar for each subject. For ELA, it was what, 31%? Math was 20, 23%. Science is 5%. Social studies 
And then overall, kids who pass all four areas, 27%. And so if you don't know, you should know this, that our kids are taking a very rigorous test now in the state of Georgia. We, our state adopted the Common Core standards, the national standards. We tweaked them a little bit in 2010, and starting in 2015, our assessments just became more rigorous. And so you'll see here, uh, not unique to Clayton, but Clayton clearly is impacted. You'll see that our data is not what it used to be in the, on the CRT when it was in the 80s and 90s, because it's a more rigorous assessment, which we believe is a more, uh, the assessments reflect really what students need to really be able to know and be able to do. And so our work right now is to get that data back in the 80s and 90s to be very honest with you. It won't happen overnight. It will take time because, as I've shared with the team, there are many variables that come into play. Uh, one variable that we deal with in Clayton that you all should be very familiar with, we have one of the highest mobility rates in the state. 32% team? Yes, that means on any given day, 32% of our kids are coming or what? Why is Clayton the highest mobility place uh, rate? In the, why do we have the highest mobility rate in the state? I can't tell you the history. but. Clearly, decisions were made that position this county. Maybe it's just where it is in the metro area, the airport. It borders Fulton, DeKalb, Henry, and maybe people get you know, reasonable prices of, of houses here, and then they decide to move other places. Or if they can't go other places, they come here. I don't know, but it is what it what? It is what it is. And so what we do internally is we try to mitigate for that to ensure that our kids are getting good instruction wherever they go, whenever they come into Clayton. And hopefully when, uh, if they leave and if they come back, we can pick them up from, you know, pick up where they uh, left off. So this is our work. Again, I want to see that data in the 80s and 90s, but it will not happen overnight. Uh, it will not happen overnight. And so today what I'd like to do is spend some time talking about what we're actually doing to move it closer and faster to the 70s and 80s and 90s. And that's our advanced learning expectation. We really believe that if you, if you continue to do what you have done, you'll keep getting the results that you always what? Always get. And so we're at a point in Clayton where when I look at the data, if you look at those last few years, that data is not a reflection of what our students can do. That data is a reflection of our internal processes and, and policies and I will, I will say a lot of adult actions that has impacted what students learn. So what we've decided to do this year is instead of giving a few kids access to high expectations, we're going to give all kids access. See, what you see there is few kids getting access. But now what we're doing is all kids are expected at the K-5 level to do problem-based learning. All kids are expected to do projects, not just a few kids. All kids are expected to do science projects, social studies projects. All kids are expected to solve problems all kids at the kindergarten through fifth grade level. And then as they matriculate to middle school, all kids, not just a few, but all of our sixth graders are taking accelerated math now, this year for the first time in Clayton County. You say, what does that mean? All sixth graders will take all their sixth grade math plus half of their seventh grade math in the sixth grade. When they get to the seventh grade math, they take the other half of the seventh grade math plus all of the eighth grade math. So when they get to the eighth grade, they've already completed math six, seven, and eight. Then now they're ready for high school what? Algebra. That data reflects oftentimes the kids who are doing well or the kids who have already had algebra. And so we figured, listen, why are we continuing to do this if it's not good for all kids? If the kids who are in eighth grade algebra are doing well, why not we change our way of thinking and our way of doing to ensure that all kids have access to it. And that's exactly what we're doing this year. Advanced learning is occurring. All of our sixth graders this year are taking advanced accelerated math. And in two years, all of them will be expected to complete high, high school algebra in the eighth grade. Someone may ask the question, well, what about those eighth graders who struggle with high school algebra? That's OK. Because in the ninth grade, guess what else they'll be able to get again? Another year of what? Algebra. And I can assure you, as a former high school teacher, two years of good teaching in algebra will make you better prepared than no years of what? Algebra. And so we're good uh, with what we're doing at the middle school. So uh, we're preparing the kids at the K-5 level. And as they move into middle school, we're accelerating them. And there will be some other things. And there are some other things occurring at the middle school level relative to English, language, arts, science, and social studies. 
but our big focus right now is on math. But there are some other things that we don't talk about that's occurring in the other subject areas. Uh, increased rigor, more problem-based learning, uh, database uh, questioning, et cetera. All of those things are happening. And so while you hear about math, I don't want you to ever think that the other areas are going unattended to. You may have heard recently in the, uh, in the newspaper that Bill Gates awarded our district a $1.2 million um, grant. That's because of what we're doing in math. They were so excited that, thank you all, they were so excited that all the districts in the nation that we decided to just say, no, all kids, not just a few, but all kids. And that's what they've been wanting districts to do, but so many districts are afraid to do it. They want to just only the kids who come from certain families and their parents have certain degrees. No, we said, no, that's not our case. We're not going to do that anymore because that's not good for all kids. And so we were very pleased. You know, that's when you know you're going in the right direction, when you, when you get others on the outside validating. Now, that's what needs to be happening. That's what needs to be happening. We've been working with the College Board, National Math Science Initiative, and they, they've been sharing with us that out of all the districts they work with around the nation, they don't have many, if any, that are being this bold about ensuring that all kids are getting these experiences. And, and, I, and you all know, as I shared, I'm a former math teacher. I'm not saying it's going to be easy for us. It won't be, because we've got to train teachers to teach algebra very well, right? But if I'm going to spend time training you to teach something, I'm going to spend time or paying for you to teach or paying you to learn what to teach. I'm going to make sure that you're learning content that's going to be beneficial to students. And that's exactly what we're doing. So the grant helps us. Uh, and right now, our teachers are in the middle of it. They are working with all of our sixth graders to learn accelerated math towards, by the time they get to eighth grade, they will be taking that algebra. So we've got two years to get those eighth grade teachers ready to teach that high school algebra. And that's what we're working to do. Um, and we appreciate our community support. Um, some kids are being double-dosed. That means they're getting the accelerated plus an additional uh, uh, course or so of mathematics. So we're just doing what we can to close all those gaps so our kids can be successful. We're doing the same thing in, read in reading as well. Uh, this data here doesn't show this, but for our ninth grade literature this year, we had a 10% increase. That means our ninth graders, now you all don't understand, <laughs> when you get ninth graders improving, you're doing good work. Because that's often the most challenging group to show progress with. Because if most kids drop out of high school, what year do they grad, drop out in? Ninth grade. If most, most discipline issues occur in what grade? Ninth grade. And so when we saw that, we saw a decrease in discipline issues. We saw an increase in ninth grade uh, reading scores and ninth grade uh, proficiency rates. We thought, oh, we must be doing something right. Because when we can get the most challenging grade to improve in the district, then we know we're headed in the right direction. Uh, and so to that end, what are we doing? As the kids get through middle school, I said K-5, problem-based learning, integrated curriculum, middle school, accelerated math towards eighth grade algebra. But by the time they get to ninth grade, this year all of our ninth graders are expected to take advanced placement, dual enrollment, and a career pathway, period. Some kids are only doing advanced placement. Some kids are only doing dual enrollment. Some kids are doing both. It doesn't matter to me. I expect you to do at least one of them at least one of them, and all of you have to complete a career pathway. So let's talk about the rationale for that. I'll start with the career pathway. In our district, kids who complete a career pathway, and that's really defined by three select career. If you have a pathway, there are certain three courses that you complete. If you complete the three courses, and then you take some type of end of pathway assessment, you're considered a pathway completer. The kids who were doing that in our district, they were graduating from high school at a rate of 95%. So it just seemed to us that if the kids who are doing this graduate at a rate of 95% and everybody else only graduates at a rate of 71% as an adult, what should we require of them? Everybody needs to complete a what? To career pathway. So now this year, every ninth grader is expected to complete a what? They can do more than one. And what is a career pathway? And then we say we're college. We're preparing our kids for college and careers. It just doesn't make any sense to me. If we're a school community, a school system, and we say we're preparing our kids for college and careers, but you don't require them to com complete a career pathway, then are you really preparing them for college and what? So we need to align our, what we're doing up with what we're saying. <laughs> and so now it is the expectation that all of our kids complete a career pathway. And I would imagine over time, just like 
the 95% who complete a pathway graduate, I would imagine our grad rate, which I believe will be about 73% this year, an increase from last year. Yeah, over time, we're going to get up to that 80 and 90 percent. It takes time, but we will get there. Um, so we're, we're, last year was our first year above 70. Now we're at 73. Out of the 11 high schools, and we have 11, seven of them are already above 80 percent. Seven, seven. And two of the seven are at 100 percent. The other four are in the 70s, and the data is telling us this year that many of them are getting closer to 80 percent. We have one alternative school. It's in the, I want to say about 35, 37, 36. It's close to 40 percent. It's the lowest in the district, which probably bring us, brings us down a little bit. But it has the highest grad rate of all alternative schools in the metro area. So we know we're doing the right work. We just got to keep working with our ninth graders. You know, again, if we lose kids, that's the year we what? So what I think is impacting us, and we were, we then this, been discussing this, what we know it is, because we have such a high mobility rate. See, if they start with us as ninth graders, guess what happens? The state includes them in our cohort. So once they leave, even if they don't come back to us, let's say they don't do well somewhere else and there's no record that they went somewhere else, we still have to take the hit for those students. So what we're noticing is um, when you have a high mobility rate, it really has a negative impact on your grad rate because kids are coming and going, coming and going, coming and going, and then you all know what happens. The more you come and go, come and go, come and go, that increases the likelihood that you will not what? Graduate. And so we're, again, hopefully at 73, close to 74, all of those high schools are doing well. Alternative school, we're going to keep working. We believe our strategies are working, so we're not going to abandon what we're doing. It's just a matter of what? A matter of time. And then I believe if, and this is, this is where we're asking your help, as we help families and, and inform families how important it is to get our kids in school and to keep them where in school, we're going to continue to see our grad rate as an urban school system, if you will, get in the 80s and 90s. And that's going to be a good thing. Um, so work to do there, but we're headed in the right direction. And so ninth graders are also expected, in addition to career pathways that they're expected to complete by the time they graduate from high school, ninth graders are also expected to take at least one advanced placement or and dual enrollment course. So we worked with College Board and the National Math Science Initiative to identify the courses that we would be best for a ninth grader who's never been an advanced placement to take that we believe that they could be successful in. We came up with two courses in particular, human geography, advanced placement human geography, and advanced placement environmental science. And guess what? We looked at the curriculum. Whether you're taking regular human geography or advanced placement human geography, is still human what? It's no different. If you're taking environmental science, whether it's regular environmental science or advanced placement environmental science, it's still environmental what? So what do we do? We said we're taking out the regular courses, and all of our kids are expected to take the advanced placement what? And we're going to make sure we provide the teachers the training and the support for that to occur. I'm glad we chose those two courses because we found out something I think we knew but we weren't really discussing. Guess which school system in the state students outperforms the state and the international population in human geography? Glenn County. So we, we weren't even building on the successes that we were already experiencing. Because we were so busy listening to drama about who we were, we weren't looking at our own data to say, y'all already uh, an example of how ninth graders are doing in human geography. So, I mean, we, we looked at our data and, and they give you, for your district, they give you how you compare to the state and how you compare to the global population. We were outperforming the state and the global population in human geography. So, to me, that was a no-brainer. Maybe all our ninth graders need to be in there. Environmental science. And so you all, this year, all ninth graders, the goal is all 100%, but you all know some of them won't do it. But principals will work with parents and make those decisions on one-to-one -one basis. But I feel we believe if we can shoot for 100% and we land at 80 and 90%, that's better than 10%, isn't it? And so that's what we're doing. And so you should see, you're seeing, and all of us are witnessing a fundamental shift in Clayton County where people who look outside, they don't just come to Clayton because they can't go anywhere else. 
They come to Clayton because they want their students exposed to high expectations. We are writing the narrative about what goes on in the Clayton County public school system. We have high expectations of our students, and that expectation for students to participate in advanced placement in the ninth grade and will matriculate with them. So we're looking at what courses we expect in the 10th grade in the 11th grade, in the 12th grade. So over the next four years, you're going to see our high schools just fundamentally change and more of our kids are going to be really prepared to go to college. And many of them will now have advanced placement on their transcripts. And you all know that looks good to a college registrar who has to make a decision as to whether or not you accept the student or not. And so we're really changing, the, the we're transforming, if you will, our district and I don't even know if people realize the transformation that's really taking place. High expectations across the board. And I'm very pleased that, you know, I've been in some places where people will push back, but it was always the people, the, the people who always pushed back were the people whose children were actually doing these things. But I'm so glad in Clayton that our folk realize that this is for all children, not just for children whose parents are educated, but all kids. Is it a perfect implementation? No, nothing that we've done has ever been perfect. But is it good for children? Yeah, it's good for children. If nothing else, as adults, we should not tell children what they can't do. We should provide them the opportunity to do it, and then if they come to the conclusion on their own with our support that that's not what they can do or they don't necessarily have a desire to do it, that's another thing, isn't it? But we as the adults should not be telling our kids what they can't do. Or looking at uh, children who we don't know and saying just by looking at some piece of paper what they can't do. We're, we're just moving away from, from that approach, if you will, in, in, in this school system because we believe that our kids can do it. And the research is clear. There's a, a research by the New Teacher Project that says that the research says that students will do whatever teachers put in front of them. So if a teacher puts a low, low content in front of them, guess what students will do? Low content. But if the teacher puts high, rigorous content in front of them, guess what the students will do? The students will meet whatever expectation the adults have of them. And so we're in a fundamental shift where it's the expectation in this school system that we do not, we no longer have low expectations of our students all of our students, but now we have high expectations of all of our what? Students. And we're going to provide the support, the resources, the training, et cetera, for that to occur in our school system. So this data that you see here today, y'all be patient with me, over some time, it's not gonna all happen in one year, two years, and three years, but over some time, we're gonna see this data what? Fundamentally shift toward 80 and 90% of our kids being proficient and higher. And we couple what we're doing at the middle school and high school with what we're doing at the elementary school level, we have the right strategy in place. We've just got to continue to tweak the strategy and eliminate all the, the what I call the stumbling, st the stumbling blocks, and the excuses that sometimes people, we adults have, why kids can't do well. The kids, our kids can do the work. We just, as adults, we've got to expect and believe that they can. And then we've got to prepare ourselves. If you teach math, you need to know what? You need to know math. If you teach science, you need to know what? You teach history, you need to know what? You teach English, reading, you need to know. And that's the expectation. Our kids can do it. Uh, and, and sometimes what the data doesn't tell us is that sometimes we as adults, we don't take responsibility for that data because, oh, that's the kids. No, the kids have done only what you've asked them to what? Ask them to do. Ask them to do at a higher level. They'll show you they can do it at a what? Higher level. And that's where we are. And that's, that's this administration. That's your superintendent and the team. We just believe that our kids can do it. And I take no excuses. I don't care what mama did and what daddy did and what income level the family is because I come from a family that wasn't wealthy, but we did it. It was all about high expectations, access, and adults who cared about us. And so, I, you know, people say, oh, the children of color can't do it. They can. I'm a child of color. I did it. And so, uh, or the 
children with language issues, they can't do it. No, the data tells us they can do it. As a matter of fact, they are more likely to do it because they only really learn, they already know one language, they learn in another language. So it's, there are just no excuses. The only thing that prevents us from doing it is a lack of access and support. And we're going to make sure that our kids have access, they have quality teachers, quality leaders, and all the support that they need to meet these expectations. And so that's where we are with improving the data. I'll just say more to come. It's a work in progress. Um, and we're going to eventually get there. And if you say, if, what if you don't make 90 to 80%? Well, if, even if I make it to 70%, that's a lot better than where I was, right? <laughs> And I'm good with that, and we've got to be good with that. The next thing is the SPLOS. I want to say thank you all for supporting the SPLOS. Uh, the faith-based community, y'all did an excellent job getting the word out and using your pulpits, your congr and getting the word out to your congregations. We passed it with a rate of 77% saying yes. That was the highest rate we've ever had over the years of 20 plus years of SPLOS here in Clayton County. And so now we'll be building, the, from the first project slated is the New Morrow High School. Uh, a new Forest Park Middle School, a new elementary school in the Lovejoy area, a new, our first very own college and career academy in Clayton County that will have aviation, artificial intelligence, and logistics and transportation that will serve all of the high schools here in Clayton County. Uh, we'll have a new, our first very own uh, early learning center for our three-year-olds all the way up to maybe second grade in the Riverdale area. Um, and so we're excited about that. That's going to really help us get more kids access to pre-K. Because right now in Clayton County, about 25% of kids who, who could be in pre-K come to us because of space. Another 25% go to private providers. 50% of kids who could be in pre-K are not in pre-K in Clayton County. So we're working to nip that in the bud, you know, to, to reduce that a bit by opening up an early learning center. And right now, I believe we got another property that may be gifted to us in the Riverdale area. And we're gonna turn that into another early learning center. Uh, I'm not the Riverdale area, the Forest Park area. And so I'm hopeful you all, so those, who, those of us who know the word of prayer, <laughs> we're looking forward to the gifting of that property, which is gonna be another powerful early learning center. Because I really believe if we could get more of our kids in pre-K, this data is gonna change a lot quicker. We notice the kids who go to pre-K, we, we track their data. We notice that normally they, they read and do math on grade level, and they stay on what? It's the kids who don't go that are often a year or more behind. It's not that they, they're, any, they're not any smarter, it's just that the kindergarten teachers have to teach skills that they could have learned when. And so now, if the t kindergarten teacher is teaching things that they, they could have learned in pre-K, then what are they now behind on? Kindergarten content. And then when they get the first grade, what does the first grade teacher got to do? <coughs> Teach stuff that the kindergarten teacher should have taught that they didn't have time to do. So you see that cycle? So if we can get more of our kids in pre-K, we believe over time, we will see a fundamental shift of this data. And so whatever support that we can get from you all, as we do our best and try to be as innovative as possible to open up more pre-K seats in this county, I really believe that's gonna help contribute to us shifting this data. Uh, it won't take 20 years if we can get more of those kids in pre-K. So I'll pause there to see. Um, we'll continue with our Chromebooks, issuing Chromebooks to our kids in grades three through 12 over the next several years. We'll continue to buy new bus, school buses, as you know, Every year some buses get too old to drive, so you gotta buy new buses. We'll continue with our HVAC upgrades because we wanna make sure our schools feel good, the climate's good. We'll continue with renovations. Hopefully you'll see Jonesboro. Uh, it's, that uh, construction is going very well. You'll be getting an invitation hopefully soon about a, a ribbon cutting for the gym. We want them to have their basketball season in their new gym. The whole building won't be complete, but hey, we're not gonna wait till the whole building's complete to use that gym because they've got some, some games that they need to play. But hopefully you've seen the new Riverdale uh, High School. Uh, when I say new, it's, it's the same building. It's just been renovated and it's beautiful, beautiful. Um, we started out with a gym a few years ago and now the whole building has been renovated and North Clayton Middle School, hopefully you'll see, you, if you've not seen that, go by and look at North Clayton Middle School. I mean, it looks like a college campus, it, it, it's beautiful. So we're, we're, I want you all to know we're, we're being very responsible with the SPLOS funds and doing exactly what we, communicated to our community 
that we would do and that you would want us to do. Um, so that's really what I wanted to share. I'm going to pause here because it's your time to share. If you have questions, if you have comments, if you have concerns, safety is an area that we're working on constantly. Our discipline data is improving, but we've had to ramp up some strategies at our games lately because of just, I think it's just in the air. You know, everybody just on edge. The heat, is it the heat? So uh, Dr. Simpson and Dr. Smith and uh, Athletics, they've been working with Chief Trawick to ramp up security. Just, we just want people to be safe at the games. Um, and and, and, and uh, Jada will be sending something out to parents, reminding parents that, you know, tell your kids when you come to games, we need everybody on their best, best behavior. You know, we, we, want it, we have these, act, these events to give the community and everybody something to do to support our kids. We need everybody on their best what? Behavior. And so our administrators are there. Um, but most importantly, you know who we need? They're our parents. Because whose children are they? They're our children, our parents' children. And you know, it's amazing when you tell your child to sit down, they'll sit down. And if they don't, you did something wrong. Y'all hear me? So we're working on those things, and, but whatever concerns you all have. So Pastor Reynolds, it's good to see you today. Please share. So how many students are we serving? We serve a little over 55,000 students and, in Clayton County. Okay. And how are we in putting uh, all Right now, Dr. Wilson, come and give everybody an update and always share where we started and then where we are yes. so they can get a little perspective. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you so much. Um, I came to Clayton Schools about two years ago, October 2017, and I was sitting at a board meeting in October when the board approved me, and I heard that we had 647 teacher vacancies, and I was alarmed. So we immediately went to work with the support of Dr. Lee and the board to revamp some things too the hiring of teachers and other employees and retention. So today we are at about 150 vacancies. So we significantly improved, but as you can tell, there's still lots of work to do. But one of the things, even with 150 vacancies, what we're not doing is just accepting anyone who applies. So we have a thorough screening process in place, and I've shared with principals that if you don't feel that that teacher is the best candidate for those children, give us something. Will work to support the substitute until we can find the best teacher for those students. And hopefully, you know, in short order, we'll reduce that number. But we're at about 150. Can you share how the special ed teacher situation is impacting our vacancies? Yes. So I was at a, a seminar this past Monday, and the uh, state superintendent, Richard Woods, was there speaking to us. And, <clears throat> excuse me, of the hour or so that he was there, he probably spent about 40 minutes speaking to special education in terms of the severe shortage in the state of Georgia. And they're in uh, somewhat communications with the uh, Georgia Professional Standards Commission, the commission which sets a credentialing for all teachers in the state of Georgia. Um, they don't really have a leader at the PSC now, so things are stalled. But they're in, com in communication in terms of the qualifications for a special ed teacher. Just very quickly, if I may, if we have a regular ed teacher here, <coughs> a special ed teacher here, this teacher may only have to pass just a one test to be certified to teach. The special ed teacher may have to take four, five, six tests in addition to paperwork beyond the yeah. week. So we're having a hard time, not just place all school systems across the state and across the nation retaining, we're hiring and retaining special ed teachers. It has gotten so difficult to where teachers are now who have special ed certification are removing it from their certificate because it's so much work. So there's conversation at the state level and at the national level, which is going to take in order to change where we are with, with special education. So out of the 150 or so vacancies we have, how many of those would you say are special ed? About 60. About 60 are special ed. So in order to um, uh, help with that, we've gone back to something that we call e-subs, um, extended subs. And with that, very quickly, what that is, we've identified individuals who have some type of background special education, they're not qualified for a full teaching uh, position or certificate, but they start a coursework, they maybe pass the test or so, they have a desire to be a special ed teacher. We brought them in, we're gonna bring them in, work with our professional learning department and perhaps Clayton State to get those individuals through a program or our TAP program to get them certified. But essentially we're building a pipeline for our employees or anyone uh, for that matter, we're doing our, for our four-year home 
Lord, I'm trying to really try to fill those vacancies, but it's not going to happen overnight. But we are working with it. Yes, ma'am. It is just for special aid at this time. Yes. And I, I should say this, Dr. Wilson, that a part of the recruitment and retention, because we believe that our retention rate has improved. We believe that when teachers see a district moving in the right direction, they see a vision, they see consistent leadership, that they'll be more inclined to come. So we believe over time, like we had 600 vacancies, we're down to 150. We believe with these strategies and consistency in leadership, consistency in vision, consistency in our work, we believe that we will attract, if you will, and retain more people, teachers who want to work in Clayton County public schools. And so we have a responsibility, but every principal knows they have a responsibility because they've got to create a culture and a climate at the school that not only do they retain, hire someone, but that person decides they want to stay with them from year to year to year. And so, and, and, and the community has a responsibility. I tell the uh, community leaders this all the time, parents, I told this, you know, we can't see all these negative reports about Clayton County and expect people want to, want to come to Clayton County to teach and live. And so, you know, I'll just share this with you because hopefully you all can appreciate this. I said, if you go to high performing school systems around the nation, I can tell you one thing that they don't do. They don't air out all their drama in, on television. They'll come in spaces like this and they'll hash it out. But you know why? Because they know that whatever is aired, it impacts decisions that people will make to come to teach their children or to buy houses in their community. And they want their values to always what? Increase. And so I, I, I do think sometimes part of our work is educating people that yes, the superintendent has a responsibility, HR, principals do, parents, st students, but we at, as a community at large, we all have a what? responsibility because the images that we project, project about our community are the images that people will use to decide whether or not they will come to our community or not, or if they come and not remain, uh, and, and stay. And so even discipline is important. We can't have children just cussing, and I use the, the, the southern term, cussing folk out. You just can't have that and, and, and nothing's done. You gotta have high expectations. Because if you hire people today, but they see that you just let your children do whatever they want to do, and they're disrespectful, and they're causing, they're fighting, and y'all know, you won't retain them. And so our work is to make sure we recruit, but also to what? Retain. And so it's just ongoing work. We're pleased with the progress, but we've got more work to do. So um, we're not satisfied. We're thankful that it's not what it was, but we're not satisfied, because we've got more progress to make. Thank you. Any, did we answer your question? Hello. Hello. My name is Tara Wilson. I have a comment that I wanted to make. I, um, relationships are very important to me. I volunteer at my children's school, and, and just being on this advisory board is really, really important to me. I wanted to share an experience that I had with um, the maintenance department. I sent an email because there were was a classroom that did not have AC. I um, reached back out this morning because the issue was resolved. And I think that that's very important when we talk about faith-based things. You have to know a situation is going to turn around before you enter that situation. I'm gonna say that again because so many times, like you said, looking at the numbers, it looks daunting, but we serve a God who, who, who doesn't pay attention to the numbers. He moves as he would have us move. And so in re-engaging with that entire situation, I spoke to a gentleman and it wasn't a great conversation. That situation turned around. God allowed for us to have another conversation and it was beautiful. So even when things don't work out the first time around, look at it again because there, there is something there that will bless our entire community. I'm looking forward to working with the board. I would love to have more information on how we can impact the alternative school. I know last year we had a calendar going where we could go in and talk about some positive things to, you know, just help encourage students. So is there anyone that can give any information? Dr. On that? Simpson is over schools and he'll connect you with the, Dr. Young is the uh, uh, executive director over the alternative school. He would love to have a conversation with you. Because as you well know, many of those students there need that additional support. And so please, okay?
and I'm glad to hear that, I, you know, that, that situation came to our, our desk. And, and sometimes it's just about, it's about creating, reminding people what culture we're creating in our school system of responsiveness. I want one of respect, and I want one in which all of us as employees value our community. Because without our community, there's no need for us to be here. And that's just the expectation. I'm not going to be disrespectful to people. I'm not going to let people to be di uh, allow them to be disrespectful to me. But I'm not going to allow any staff member that I'm aware of on this team. And we've got 7,000 plus. You cannot disrespect this community, period. And that's just. And we're going to solve problems. And, and that's it. And if we can't solve problems, why are we here? Anything else? Mm -hmm. This is, um, um, I was taking notes and clicking, but I did not have questions. Um, you mentioned about Ms. Clear was going to address the gay um, affairs afterwards, the, um, in regards to the parents speaking to their students. Could you answer that possibly about them picking them up? Excellent. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, that's part, that was part of our conversation about kids hanging out. And we were, we're working, so you all will know, we're working with all the municipalities, Chief Roberts of the Clayton County Police Department. We're all working together because we want safe events. And then after the event is over, we want kids to exit and, fa and family spectators to go home safely. And we know sometimes they'll go to the little restaurants and hang out. So they're even making sure that they're policing those venues just to make sure we want our kids safe. And, and you all know Sheriff Hill. Sheriff Hill is a no-nonsense sheriff. We don't want anybody drunk. We don't want any drama in Clayton County. And I think someone told me, I didn't know this, but I think Dr. Simpson told me, everybody knows, don't go to Clayton County if you want to commit a crime. That ain't the county to go to. And, 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 we, and that's a good reputation to have. This is the county to come to if you want your kids to have access to a good educational system. This is not the county to come to if you want to commit a crime. And our community, you all, is changing. There is a shift going on in our county. And so while the data is important, you got to look beyond the data. There is really something going on in our community, in our schools, that is transforming our entire community. And it's just a matter of time. And all of us, we appreciate being a part of the movement, the transformation. And we're honored by it, honored to be a part of it. Uh, it's not perfect. Now, y'all tell me, what do I need to do once I leave here? What, am, what are we doing wrong? Because as you said, many families come into Clay County who don't know about the curfew. There is a curfew. Did yes. you all know that? And so that's more of an incentive for parents to pick up their Yeah, children. we will. That's what excellent. See, you never heard that, have you? <laughs> so we'll send it out because I don't even know it. I know we have one. I just don't know what it, what it says. Oh, you know they would have it posted there, wouldn't they? <laughs> Very good. See, this is a good advisory, good feedback for us. Dr. Beasley, would you share uh, some information about the world uh, process that the county has been uh, grasping hold of the instructional part that we met a couple of weeks ago, that initiative? Uh, that we, uh, oh, yes. We're working. Um, last year, we took a trip to uh, Toulouse, France, to, to the Ministry of Education to to set up our first student exchange program. You say, why Toulouse, France? Because they have a big Airbus industry where they make the Airbus airliner. They're based in Toulouse, France. And so we took a team and we stayed in, you all, we stayed in a school that had a hotel. And so all we had to do was get there, but they provided the food and I think we may have had to pay a small fee, but it was a hospitality school. So we were able to visit all the various high schools that they have in uh, Toulouse, France. They have a school for aviation, a high school for aviation, a high school for uh, automobile um, technology, automotive technology. They have a high school for, you name it. What they, what they do in France is similar to what I think they do in many European nations. 
England, they, what our kids will get if they go to college, like at, a, at a Atlanta Tech, they get in high school there. They feed their, their uh, areas that they need employers, employ, employees, they feed those areas from the high school. So they've organized their educational system such that if you're going to study aviation, you know, you be an air, airline, a, air, a mechanic for airline industry, you get trained to do that at the high school level. Isn't that amazing? We saw kids working on planes, uh, things that our kids would only get when, if they went to technical school after they graduate. Uh huh. I don't think we stop. It, it looks different now because we have career pathways in all of our schools. One thing we've got to do, this is what we have, what, when we went to, to Toulouse, we came back with uh, a different vision because we realized we needed to do something a little different than what we were used to here in the American school system. We've got to make sure that our pathways are, are more aligned with what was really needed within our area. And so like in Clayton, we didn't even have an aviation pathway. We're, the airport sits right here in Clayton County and we don't have an aviation pathway, so we fixed that quickly. So now we've got an aviation pathway at North Clayton High School. We'll have one in the College and Career Academy. Um, we've just got to make sure that that alignment is there. And pathways change. We didn't do a good job at keeping the pathways current. We hire somebody in a particular area, and just because they're certified, we keep that person, even though it, it, their job is, no longer exists. So we decided we're not doing that any, any longer. Either they train up, or we got to release them and hire someone with the current skills that are needed. And so that's the transformation that occurring in our career technology department. So we look forward to the new College and Career Academy. We've got pathways in all of our high schools. We're changing, getting rid of some of the old pathways where the jobs are non-existent. But you should know, we still have construction because we still need to build houses, don't we? Yeah. We still need plumbers and, and uh, welders, don't we? So those pathways exist here in Clayton County. Um, we still have automotive technology. Why? Because all of us still drive cars that break down, right? So we have that, that pathway in Clayton County. And so we're just, there are some pathways we need to have. There's one of the challenges we have is just getting students to be interested in some of these pathways. See, in America, we think everybody's supposed to earn a four-year college degree. And a lot of those very lucrative pathways in career technology don't necessarily require a four-year college what? We did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. There you go. <laughs> Being a parent. So, we, um, so he went in the first day. He texted like, oh my God, mom, thank you for not up. And now he's getting his drawing for the first day. Excellent. And he's going to a train. I wish he could get into the one at North Clayton Bible to have a pocket to get him his license. But he's found what he wants to do. So we, got a, we, we have a school choice. If he wants to get to that one in North Clayton, we'd love to get him over there. We got a school choice process. Dr. Simpson, Dr. Wilson has an update. Let me share a little bit about CTAE. Um, again, this past Monday, Superintendent Woods was there, and that was the other 20 minutes that he spent speaking about CTAE. And I asked the question about what support can the state provide to school systems that want to offer these uh, programs in CTAE, but we're having a challenge finding individuals to teach those particular subjects. And part of that challenge is that the requirements that the state sets forth from these individuals who are coming from industry, you may be a master plumber or, or, or a construction worker, but you haven't passed the gauge, you don't have all of those educational requirements that the traditional teacher has. Which are not necessary. They're not necessary. So, you know, that's planning. so there's going to be a drastic shift. So one part was the credential, and the other part was whether or not the state will look at providing additional funding to pay those individuals differently. These, these are typically higher paid individuals making 80, 90, 100 plus thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. You want them to come and do the same work for $45,000. So most individuals are not willing to do that unless they're independently wealthy, but we are you know, asking those questions and trying to see what support the state can provide to us in school districts that are trying to, to increase uh, enrollment in those programs for options for students. So they're working on 
They're working on it, but it, it, I can tell you it's probably going to be a slow process, but at least they're having the conversation. It's a challenge, but you know, I'm not making excuses, but at the district level, it's very little that we can do because we don't set the requirements and for credentialing in order to get the certificate to teach in that field, and the state only provides so much funding for those individuals to teach those those courses. So there are conversations. So should we start buzzing the state? Absolutely. 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 Yeah. You're elected yeah. officials, so you know we're at the table, so it helps when you put that additional pressure on that other end force. Well, I would start with your with your state representatives to bring it to bring, escalate it to their awareness, and then uh, always feel free to email State Superintendent Wood and let them know you're a Clayton County parent, because sometimes they need to know Clayton is being is, is speaking up, right? Yes, we are doing that uh, with the College and Career Academy that's coming on, on in a few years. We've had lots of conversations about that. And we're looking at flexible scheduling for them where they may only come in a couple of hours a day and try to pay them at a higher hourly rate mm -hmm. to try to get them something comparable to, to, to what they would be earning. So there are some options that we are exploring. We are. Um, Sometimes they, they, they're retired and they want to give back. But they just don't want to do it full time. Exactly. And so we're working on flexible scheduling that gives them that, that opportunity. Can you? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, but they're, but they're, they're retired, they're comfortable now. They don't mm -hmm. necessarily need to be making that 9000 $100,000. Right. But they do want to get back. They do. They do. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we are still yeah, Bishop, Bishop, you had that mic for a while there. Okay. I'm sorry, sir. And I don't even know now. Just kind of on the gun, but I keep hearing this word backwards. And I think sometimes we use these little um, cliche yeah. words, but we don't really explain, explain what the pathway is. And I always like to stop, say like this, the pathway is a, a trot. It says somebody has been there, and it has made a pathway that can be easily followed. So I don't know, maybe we need to add that when we're talking to the parents and the definition. I always give the example, I have a little dog. And the little dog has a, a dog house in the backyard. It always comes the same way <laughs> where it ends. It moves, it leaves a trail that you can't even get grass growing. <laughs> and I, I want to say that that pathway is so important. I am where I am because of somebody before me set me the pathway. And I saw that, you know, and you're doing the same thing. We all do the same thing. So I'm just hearing that, those little words we use to make sure we yeah. explain to them. And add illustrations to them, yeah. what people can see. Because sometimes people go by what they see mm -hmm. to move into what they understand. And, and yesterday we had that very same question that come up in the parent ad, uh, advisory PTA. They wanted to know what is a pathway. So we had to explain to them a pathway is basically a career area, and a student takes three courses in that area, and then they take a credentialing assessment at the end of those three courses. So if they pass the three courses plus a credentialing assessment they're considered a completer of the pathway, which oftentimes the credentials are national credentials. It makes it easier for them to go straight into a, uh, a post-secondary opportunity, whether a work, a work situation or further training, uh, and those credentials are recognized. And so it, you're right, it's, it's, it's a, they, they lead to many opportunities internships, jobs, more, more opportunities. And, and so that's why we want all of our kids to complete these pathways, not just a few, but all of our kids to take full advantage. And we'll, we're constantly, as I've already shared, revamping and making sure that those pathways are relevant. Relevant. I just wanted to say, when we were just talking about how, how difficult it is to get you know, master plumbers and things like that, can they be paired? with a teacher with that certification. Do you understand what I'm saying? If someone has that clearing to teach, can they be coupled, you know, assistant teacher or something under another auspice where they can still impart those skills? Skills, but, 
but not have to go through the red tape of all of the certification. So you're saying someone who's like the volunteer level or a parent? Yeah, maybe a paraprofessional. Like, I, like I, a teacher, like a teacher, co-teacher. There you go. There you go. Have we looked into just alternatives in this in this scenario of a retiree? That could be beneficial because there are. I, I used to work for the retirement system of Georgia. There are gaps. I mean, there are limits to how much you can make as a retiree. Just, just a suggestion. Have we? Have Correct. We, we have looked at that, and it's not off the table. Um, but, but for the individual, he or she would have to be what we call the teacher of record. So in order to be the teacher of record, they would have to have the proper credentials in order to issue that student a grade for that course. Okay. So if they were an assistant or something like that, they you wouldn't. Have a teacher yes. and still the master of plumber. The teacher is still the teacher. It's like a co-teaching situation. The right. plumber has a party of skills. Yeah. Can we pair those Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah I just I I just I just think there that would be a cost consideration, because um, that would have to be funded. It's like you're funding two teachers for one course, but we're going to only earn one. We're going to only earn funding for one teacher. One more suggestion: mm -hmm. Could we use the television? There's a lot in online teaching. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a possibility? Well, we do have online teaching now. Right. Now, it, uh, will there will, are there some courses that? Would be a pro are, they, are those courses appropriate for online instruction? I don't know. The team would have to look at that. But we do have online instruction within Clayton County, and we use Georgia's virtual school as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go, going back to that same, sorry, going back to that same issue um, about the, the teachers for these uh, pathways and things like that, um, is it possible to partner with any existing um, trade schools and so forth? You know, Lincoln Tech and others that, that exist now, would, is it possible to partner with some of those um, and borrow or teach essentially for something? Yeah. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's, that's an area, we, we have Atlanta Tech right down the road, so we have a partnership with them, okay. and our kids are basically participating, even though they're high school students, they can participate dual enrollment with uh, Atlanta Tech, so we do have those partnerships in existence. But again, as I shared area, one of the challenges that we've got to continue to be creative to get more kids exposed and interested in many of these lucrative, non-traditional, don't require a four-year degree, but very lucrative uh, careers. And that's just our work. And it's no perfect way to get that done. It just has to be done. And we need more parents to sign kids up for programs when we share information. Sometimes you got to put a little, put a little motivation behind our children and say, "This is what you're going to do," because sometimes they don't know. You know, they're just children. They don't know, and they don't understand that. In, in a few years, if you can, if you, I know, I'll use an example: Riverdale High School graduates, 17 or 18 of them completed their high school diploma and their associate degree at the at the same time, associate degree at the same time. And guess what they ma they majored in? Networking systems. And they will graduate from high school potentially making up to eighty, ninety, a hundred thousand dollars as eighteen year olds. Wow. I want to see that story duplicated across the district. And it's not just networking systems. We got a lot of STEM, aviation areas, mechanics. You're talking about seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year. And so we just gotta as a community make sure that our kids understand this is what we expect of you. We're gonna have doctors and lawyers and and but we, we want our EMTs, we've got an EMT pathway. Our kids are graduating at Monday's Mill High School and um, Drew High School. They graduate as high school, from high school being firefighters and EMT specialists. So it's, it's, it, we have the right work, we're doing the right work. It's just build, getting more families to take advantage, students to take advantage of these opportunities and these resources. around 
Joseph, that I am aware of and love Joy, are interested in touching the community in some way, particularly the schools. Uh, now we are collaborating with Love Joy High School, Love Joy Middle School, and Kent Elementary. And it's been a way that we found out the needs that are uh, maybe outstanding that no one's touching, and we're trying to work in partnership with those schools in order that we can be a support in uh, many different ways. Some of our members are from Guam, and they have a key club that they can tie into. Uh, we do an outreach event once a year, uh, which is a turkey giveaway at Christmas. We found out that there are so many transitional students yeah. And um, to reach out to those families is not just important at Christmas, but throughout the year. Yeah. So the partnership, uh, even with the, uh, the, the, the aviation program, our pastor is a, uh, an air traffic controller. Okay. He hasn't retired yet. But there are so many others that he works with in development in that, that, that aviation pathway. And so to partner with those who are at the airport, not just air traffic controllers, but those who are in aviation, may be the way that will be an additional way to help develop the aviation system. As a matter of fact, we have an aviation think tank, and we have uh, pilots, some of them who are currently pilots, and those who are retired that are helping us. I think that's why we've made as much progress with getting aviation uh, moving forward in our district, because we're, we've established those type of partnerships. They meet uh, throughout the year, and they basically are the advisory for us for uh, implementing our aviation program to give kids an option of going into aviation, the various pathways, if you will, for aviation. So I encourage everyone in here, as you, your church has done, everyone in here, hopefully, you're partnering with the schools in your vicinity, in your community, because they need that support. Schools can do but so much, and it helps when you have additional hands um, to partner. I know the Reynolds are partnering with North Clayton, uh, Bishop uh, Dukes, Monday's Mill, and so you said Love Joy. Uh, boy, I love to hear these high schools all taken care of. <laughs> and I know you're at Mount Zion, right? Yeah, we have Mount Zion um, Church over here. Excellent, excellent. Very good, very good. Mm -hmm. Do you finish? You finish? Yeah, we can. Mm -hmm. We can. Okay. Okay. Pastor Jerry, we do love Amy on Baptist Church. My church is actually next door to the uh, uh, superintendent's uh, office. Oh, that's there. <laughs> um, and I've been, the last uh, few seasons, I've been working with uh, Riverdale High School with football team and fellowship of Christian athletes. Excellent. Madeline Morris, assistant principal of Mount Zion High School and member of Randall Women's United Methodist Church, who's also kind of done things with our community, even though they're going to be coming in. We have a lot of our members day to day coming in to help out a lot at the school. Um, Hi, my name is Patricia Dorsey. I'm um, a minister at Tabernacle Spring Church International. Um, I think we're right, one of our locations is right next door. We tend to do more than this. Good morning, everyone. I'm Morgan Dukes, and I'm uh, with the Bishop of Apostle Peter. <laughs> and we're from Community Fellowship 
uh, Church International, and we do service. We, we spend a lot of time working with Mundysville Middle and, and High School. Those are the schools that we service primarily in this area, but not um, totally. Am I right, Bishop? No, I'll tell you. I am a possible also found uh, not there, but there have been organizations, South Metro Empowerment Alliance, and what we do is we work with the five goals of society, education being one of them, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, sharing uh, uh, the great things that the, that the county is doing in the South Metro area. Uh, Keith Reynolds, I'm the pastor of Christian Fellowship Baptist Church, which is directly across the street from North Clayton High School. And we have a partnership with North Clayton High, North Clayton Middle, North Cut Elementary, uh, West Clayton uh, Elementary, and we also work with Mount Zion Primary. So one of our efforts right now, we'll be getting school supplies out. We're running a little bit behind and getting them out, but we got them all boxed up. We just got to get them out. And uh, we look forward to also having a uh, part of Education Day, the latter part of October. We'll give a small gift to each school. <laughs> <laughs> we know that's Miss Reynolds. <laughs> I, I think that the areas partnering with the schools, really working with the principals to provide them the support they need relative to um, just getting more parents there, uh, supporting, serving the parents, even just supporting their, uh, their programs that they may have, their academic and athletic programs, supporting those as well. I think really having a conversation with every principal so you can tailor your response to exactly what they need, I think is the work as many of the schools are doing. So, and, 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 and I often say you can start out small before you get you know, too big. Just start out with the schools right there where you are and ask, have a conversation with those principals about, we wanna partner, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? And you'll see often it's not that schools want a whole lot of money, sometimes just that visible presence, um, volunteering, it, it matters. Sometimes you can just go and, and spend the day serving as a teacher's aide, volunteers or members of your congregation reading to, uh, to some kids, participating in their career days. It's, it's a, it, it, it will look differently from school to school, but establishing those partnerships, I think. Would you like to share anything? They need it. Yeah. I was listening to you on my kids. You have to come home today. Would you just introduce yourself? We did some introductions beforehand, so we'll just have a number of people. Sure. Well, I'm the difference between the school leadership and the group. That's the move out all the schools. All of them. And he gives everything that comes with all of that. And a lot comes with all of that. For our overall at the district level, we have through our federal uh, federal uh, programs department, we have individuals who work with our parent liaisons, and they do district-wide parent uh, programming as well. So yes, but they're in the federal the federal programs department, and you know we're that's right, and we have parent liaisons in most, if not every school, most schools. Uh, I, Katrina Thomas is over that area, but I, I can't think of the young lady's name who works directly with the parent liaisons. Okay. So y'all give it to her because I can't think of the name. <laughs> okay. All right, anything else? Anything else? Okay, well, we thank you for coming today. I appreciate it. 
Um, just in case uh, uh, Pastor Reynolds announced the event that I'll be at on Monday night. <laughs> Very good. Well, if all minds are clear, we appreciate everyone for coming on today, and I'll see you all the next time. Thank you.